You are listening to Gone But Never Forgotten. Our topics can include, but are not limited to, murder, sexual assault, graphic and gruesome details, and more. These topics are adult in nature and are not meant for everyone. Listener discretion is advised. Hey, what's up, you guys? I'm Catherine. And I'm Haley. And we are Saturdays Are for the Ghouls, a podcast on the Podmoth Network. We cover all things spooky, like horror movies, true crime, the supernatural, and spooky stories. In the most chaotic way possible. So join your favorite ghoul friends every Saturday, wherever you listen to podcasts. And become a spooky babe! (laughs) So spooky babes, we'll see you in your nightmares! My fellow citizens, our Earth is in the middle of a crisis, plunging deeper into chaos. No, I feel your pain and your loss. We can't stand idly by and let this happen. We must rise up and... (coughs) (coughs) Sorry. Damn it. Well, this is awkward. Hi, my name is Josh Shell, and I am the host of the Let's Start a Cult podcast. Where each episode, myself and some guests take a look at different cults from around the world. For educational purposes only and definitely not to start our own cult. Join me every other week as we break down dangerous religious cults, political extremist groups, and every other kind of cult in between. Should I apologize for the terrible southern accent? No? Okay. Subscribe and listen to Let's Start a Cult anywhere you listen to podcasts. Mark Twitchell was born on July 4th, 1979, in Edmonton, Alberta. He dreamed of making it in Hollywood, namely making blockbuster movies, and as such, he graduated from the Radio and Television Arts Program at the Northern Alberta Institute of Technology in the year 2000. He would, however, wind up being more known for things that were not done behind the camera he would instead become known for an assault, a murder, and a document called Profile of a Psychopath that was discovered after he was charged for murder in 2008. Hello, and welcome to Gone But Never Forgotten, Mark Twitchell. Hello everyone, and welcome to Gone But Never Forgotten. This week, we will be covering our first episode that is titled After the Killer, Mark Twitchell. As mentioned on our last episode, we have opened up the topics that we will be covering on the podcast because we have heard what our listeners are saying, and also because we want to have more of a variety of stories for you, our listeners. It is definitely a different feeling to cover the killer and name the episode after the killer, but we feel that it is helpful sometimes to do so. This tale is one of those where there isn't as much out there on victims, but there is a lot out there on the killer, and as such, we do feel that it is important to tell this story. As someone who takes in a lot of true crime, I feel that these stories can be just as important as unsolved cases or sad tales of those who were murdered. Mark Twitchell's story is an interesting one, and one that can open up many debates, one being whether the media that we take in can actually affect us, and the other being what we should do when we are the victims of a crime. These are arguments that are likely as old as any of these medias themselves. Absolutely. 
Mark was seemingly obsessed with Dexter Morgan, the well-known anti-hero from the show Dexter. Let's start at the beginning and tell the tale of Mark Twitchell. Mark Andrew Twitchell was born in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. Not too much is known about his family and his upbringing, but we do know that he came from a seemingly well-adjusted family. We also know that he spent at least a part of his childhood and youth living in the Midwest in the United States. In the 1990s, he returned to Canada and took a course on radio and television that was through the Northern Alberta Institute of Technology. He graduated from that school and that course in 1999. Classmates that knew him at all described Mark as a bit of a loner. He did have a small core group of friends that he hung around with regularly. Mark was described as a good friend, but someone that was not trustworthy. Mark was known in school to be the person that would always have excuses when his part of the group project was not completed. I think sadly we've all had run-ins with those type of people. I don't I already don't like the guy. I hated people like this in school. Same here. I was always the sucker that picked up the work because grades were important for me. Same. He was one of those types who always had an elaborate story, or should I say lie, as to why he didn't get his work done. That makes it worse. Just own up to the fact that you didn't do your part rather than lying all the time. Spoiler alert, incomplete work wouldn't be the worst thing that this guy would do. Let's start with the fact that in 1999, Star Wars Episode One: The Phantom Menace, premiered in Canada, and a friend of Mark's, Drew Kenworthy, decided to turn a long lineup of people waiting to see the movie into a fundraiser of sorts. As part of the fundraiser, Mark auctioned off some Star Wars illustrations and claimed that they were original concept art made by the production crew for the movie. This would turn out to be a lie. But when Drew pressed Mark on the issue, he held up the lie and refused to admit that the drawings were not authentic. So on top of everything, this guy early on was a pathological liar and had no problem lying to people to take their money for charity. You got it. This guy was an asshole. Case closed? We should probably share the rest of the story. Fair enough. Mark married for the first time in January of 2001 to a woman named Megan Castrella. She was from Illinois in the USA, and the two lived stateside from 2001 to 2004 when they divorced. In 2005, he would meet the woman that was to be his next wife, Jess, on PlentyOfFish.com, a dating site. They would get married in January of 2007, and they also had a daughter together, Chloe, who was born in 2008. Jess would divorce Mark after his arrest for the things that follow in this case. When Mark returned to Canada, he would take a string of odd jobs to make ends meet. He worked at a paper company and then would later sell alarms and security systems. Mark would become unhappy and driven to make movies and garner fame. He decided that he wanted to start off by making a fan film for Star Wars. The reality is that Mark was seemingly actually quite talented While he didn't know necessarily how to run production on a set, he loved being on set and especially became known for his work with costumes. Most of the work done on the fan film, entitled Star Wars Secrets of the Rebellion, was filmed on green screen at NAIT where he had gone to school. One of his former instructors, Chris Durham, actually gave Mark a lot of credit sharing how Mark had transformed areas of the school into areas with woodworking and sewing machines to build sets, designs, and costumes. Chris said that it was like being on a real set, and he was impressed by the scale of all of it. Secrets of the Rebellion actually helped Mark to get quite a bit of local press and online attention. In September of 2008, Mark would write and direct a horror short entitled House of Cards, not to be confused with the acclaimed show. The script was largely inspired by lead anti-hero 
character, Dexter Morgan, from the show Dexter. The movie took place in a rented garage, and the story was about a murderer who used a dating website to lure a man who was cheating on his wife into the garage and the murder that ensued. As you are about to find out, sometimes life really does imitate art, and then sometimes art is a warning sign for life. I feel like we should say that being interested in true crime and things like Dexter is not necessarily a warning sign. Oh, good lord, no, we're not saying that at all. If those were signs of all signs all by themselves, you, Julia, would be wise to get a divorce. Unfortunately, Mark was not only working on screenplays during this time. Mark was also deviating in his normal life from the mean, and he opened a Plenty of Fish account. Plenty of Fish is a dating website. This would not be a huge red flag, as dating websites are popular nowadays, but the problem was that Mark had opened an account as a female, under the name of Sheena. Mark befriended a man on POF, whose name was Gilles Tetro. As Sheena and the two chatted and made plans for Jill to pick Sheena up for a date. On October 3rd, 2008, Jill followed the directions that Sheena had given to him. The directions were bizarre to say the least, and one has to wonder how there were not red flags all over this correspondence. Sometimes people just really need a date. Yes, and sadly, as we have seen countless times, it can end up to be very detrimental to people to jump right into these kinds of things without fail-safes. Some of the red flags were the fact that Sheena did not give Jill a physical address at all. Not to mention, the directions that were given were to follow a back alley until he came across the garage with one of the doors partially opened to signal that it was the correct garage. Jill must have been one of those people who was either hard up for a date or was someone who blindly trusted because he made his way to the garage and he made his way underneath the partially opened garage door. Also of note, seemingly to try and cover up with an alibi if need be, Mark made the plans with Jill on a Friday, the day that he would go see his counselor. As Jill made his way into the garage, he was immediately attacked. He was grabbed from behind and was prodded many times with a stun baton. As Jill turned around, he realized that the assailant had a gun and was wearing a hockey mask to cover his face. Jill certainly realized quickly that this was not a date and was in fact a setup. The masked man demanded that Jill get down on the ground and then he put duct tape over Jill's eyes. It was at this moment that Jill's real realized that he was in fact likely going to die, and if that was the case, he was going to at least put up a fight and make some kind of attempt to escape. He got up off of the ground, ripped the duct tape off his eyes, and managed to steal the attacker's gun from him. However, that was when Jill realized that the gun was actually made of plastic. This gave Jill all that he needed in terms of knowledge, and he managed to temporarily escape the garage, only to be dragged back in by Mark. He then continued to fight back and actually managed to escape. This time, Jill came into contact with two people that were walking their dog, and he pleaded with them to help him, telling them that he was being attacked by a man within the garage. The pair, though, would quickly leave Jill behind because they feared that he was in fact part of a hoax that intended to make them the victims. Ultimately, Jill did manage to escape. Unfortunately, because Jill was ashamed and embarrassed that he allowed himself to be set up and allowed himself to ignore the red flags that led to the attack, shockingly, he did not report this attack to the police. Likely, he figured himself as an incredibly lucky man for escaping that situation. Jill just kept quiet until something else happened. I never quite understand situations like this. You were attacked. It appears that the attacker actually may have intended to kill you, and yet you don't tell a soul. This one falls alongside bystander effect, I think, as two of the stranger things that you see when investigating and researching true crime. It doesn't make a lot of sense to me either. 
I would definitely be call making calls if I was in this situation and managed to escape. I would be afraid that if I didn't report the crime, then it could happen to someone else. Unfortunately, in this case, that is precisely what happened. One week later to the day, on October 10th, 2008, another Friday with that built-in alibi, a 38-year-old man named Johnny Altinger told his friends that he was headed out on a date with a woman named Jen. He had met Jen on Plenty of Fish. Johnny was given directions to that exact same garage that Mark had used with Jill, but unfortunately, as time would tell, Johnny was not as lucky as Jill. Johnny was a little wiser, and I cannot stress this enough. If you go on a date or go somewhere with someone whom you maybe don't know all that well, or like this, not at all, tell someone where you are going. Johnny did do this, but unfortunately it was not going to save his life this time. After a few days of not hearing from Johnny, friends were already getting concerned. But that concern would spike when people started to receive emails from Johnny Altinger. One of the emails, for example, read, quote, Hey there, I've met an extraordinary woman named Jen who has offered to take me on a nice long tropical vacation. We'll be staying in her winter home in Costa Rica. Phone number to follow soon. I won't be back in town until December 10th, but I will be checking my email periodically. See you around the holidays, Johnny, unquote. That email was received three days later on October 13th, 2008. And we'll pause to take a break here. I'm Paige, the host of Reverie True Crime. I tell stories of helpless victims, vicious killers, predators watching their prey before they strike, survivors, petty crimes, people we think we know who do the unthinkable, and the dangers that lurk not only in the dead of night, but in plain sight and the light of day. Every once in a while, I'll also tell stories of the frightening paranormal, elusive cryptids, haunted locations, and conspiracies that may be silly or thought-provoking. You can listen to Reverie True Crime wherever you're listening to this podcast. And we're back. Everyone believed instantly that this was incredibly out of character for Johnny. He was not someone to just up and disappear like this, especially with someone that he had just met. As mentioned, Johnny had tried to cover his bases by texting the location that he was meeting Jen at to his friends. After receiving the emails, friends decided that they needed to look into things further and even broke into Johnny's house. Johnny's house didn't look like he had planned to leave at all, and they knew that something was seriously awry when they found his passport there. Because Johnny had texted the location of where he was to meet Jen, the police had somewhere to start when they were contacted by friends and family of Johnny. Police arrived at the garage, and in the garage they found Mark Twitchell's film set. Unfortunately, it seems that everyone involved suddenly was realizing quickly that something was just not right here. The fact that this was unlike Johnny was a start, but the fact that he had supposedly emailed saying that he had left the country even though he clearly did not have his passport was a serious red flag. Police spoke to Mark, but they did not view him as a suspect initially because they were operating under the assumption that Johnny had been going to meet with a woman. However, something that Mark said piqued their attention. He told police that he had recently purchased a red Mazda and that it was parked at a friend's house. The police were interested in this information because, you guessed it, they were looking for a red Mazda that belonged to Johnny Altinger. Can I just say... This guy, Mark Twitchell, he's a, he's a rocket scientist, isn't he? I mean, seriously, this guy has the police approach him at the location that Johnny was last seen, and he mentions the car that Johnny would have been driving. What a complete and utter moron this guy is. Talk about not knowing when to shut your damn mouth. 
some of these men and women that we cover are incredibly intelligent people. And while Mark, not so much. Yeah, it doesn't seem too bright to bring up the vehicle. That much is for sure. As mentioned, this definitely made Mark look a little bit different in the eyes of the police, and they actually confiscated Mark's car. Just as a little side note, Mark's license plates were vanity plates. The plates bore the letters D-R-K-J-E-D-I. Wow, a dark Jedi. Well, for those who don't know, a dark Jedi is also known as a fallen Jedi. They were former Jedi who chose to deny the light side of the Force and instead chose to follow the dark side. Perhaps that license plate was actually quite fitting. This guy certainly isn't going to be the good guy in anyone's story. But still, I think that any Jedi would use their head and brain a little more than this guy did. In the car, police would find a laptop and they would send the car to be thoroughly checked and analyzed. Further to that, Mark Twitchell was also placed under 24-hour surveillance. On October 31st, 2008, Mark Twitchell was arrested after police received the reports that indicated that blood had been found in the car owned by Mark Twitchell and that the blood had tested as a match for Johnny Altinger. Investigators had also found a knife in Mark's car that had blood on the knife itself and the sheath for the knife. What was more... The laptop seemed to hold some very interesting evidence. One of the files that had been deleted on the laptop and retrieved by investigators was entitled SK Confessions. And, as things in the case started to unfold, they realized that this was not a work of fiction, but rather a confession of sorts by Mark of what he had done and how he had done it. The file started with the chilling line, this story is based on true events. The names and events were altered slightly to protect the guilty. This is the story of my progression into becoming a serial killer. That is absolutely haunting. The reality is that there are so many ways that this guy lived up to the first four letters of his last name. This guy is a complete and utter twit. Obviously, I'm happy that this guy was dimmer than a burnt out light bulb. But seriously, he somehow believed that he was above the law and that he could explain everything away. Either that, or he was just that. A twit. It almost seems like a comedy of errors. Maybe you are right. Perhaps he thought somehow he could explain everything away because he was aspiring to be a filmmaker and every evidence would simply be chalked up as for his movies. I think he was just incredibly stupid. The document on the computer went on to lay out the rental of a garage in a quiet part of town where, quote, the approach, the apprehension, and the kill, as well as the preparation for the disposal of the body, could all be done in relative seclusion from this one building, unquote. Mark would then go on to write about how he made fake accounts on dating websites and later lured a man named Jim to the garage. I assume that Jim would actually be Johnny? That would be correct. That's what the police assumed as well. It was then written how Jim was pummeled with a pipe and then stabbed to death. The document seemed to lay everything out in great detail as to how Johnny Altinger was murdered and then how the body was dealt with. Much like in the series Dexter, after Altinger was dead, Mark went on to dismember the body right there in the garage on a table. Blood was still even visible to the naked eye when police checked the garage. Photos show multiple blood spatters on the table, all tagged as evidence. All of the doors and windows were covered with garbage bags and plastic wrap that was taped to them. Forensic tests on the garage also showed a very large amount of blood had been shed on the floor of the garage. After murdering and dismembering Altinger, Twitchell attempted to burn his remains in a barrel and when they proved to be impossible, he dumped the man's limbs and organs into a sewer. This was corroborated by police as they had found a barrel in the garage that was badly burned. Police also searched for two years for the remains belonging to Johnny Altinger, but only found them two years later when Mark Twitchell finally gave them a Google Maps image of where he had disposed of them. 
The remains were less than a block away from where the police had stopped searching in sewers. The document even went into greater detail about what happened before and after the murder of Jim, who was Johnny Altinger. There is descriptions of all his preparations, including purchasing a hockey mask, a hunter's game processing kit, a 45-gallon steel drum, and a hunting knife, which was described in the document as the kill knife. There is also a very elaborate description of setting up a kill room in the rented garage. The document then goes on to lay out pretending to be a woman online in order to lure victims to himself. Twitchell wrote that at first he intended to lure married men, but he then decided against that because he believed that a married man would be reported missing to authorities much faster than single men, and as such, he targeted single men. He even wrote about targeting men who were average height and build so that he could overpower them. The document even details an earlier account of a run-in with a man named Frank who comes to the garage and manages to escape his grasps after fighting back. An obvious allusion to the encounter with Jill. The chillingness of the encounter with Altinger shows that even he had a chance to escape. When Johnny first arrives at the house, he is early and he sees Mark in the garage who then told Johnny that Jen was running late. Johnny left the house and came back 20 minutes later, only to leave again. Jen then contacted Johnny and apologized for being late and even offered to reschedule their date for another time, but Johnny offered to come back later that night. From there, after the murder, Mark broke into Johnny Altinger's apartment and used his own computer and information to send the emails out to friends and family to try and cover up and buy himself more time to cover up the murder. All in all, the document and the evidence that was uncovered in the garage and in Twitchell's car was more than enough evidence to bring the case to trial. Mark Twitchell tried to cover up everything by stating that the murder was only in self-defense after Johnny attacked him, and that the entire thing was an elaborate hoax by himself to get some publicity for his short House of Cards. Even going as far as to say that his attack on Jill was for the same reason, and that he had hoped that Jill would go to the media or police for the publicity that that would bring. The end result was that on April 12, 2011, Mark Twitchell would be found guilty of first-degree murder in the death of Johnny Altinger and sentenced to life in prison without parole possibility for at least 25 years. There was also an attempted murder charge filed for the attack of Gilles Tetro, which would later be dropped because of the first-degree murder conviction that had already carried a maximum sentence. There were attempts to appeal the trial and conviction, but to no avail. Twitchell tried to say that because of the vast media presence around his trial, there was no way that the unsequestered jury were untouched by media bias against him, and as such, they could not be seen as credible. Thankfully, all of that was turned down. So, where is Mark Twitchell today? Well, I am happy to report that he's spending his time at the Saskatchewan Penitentiary in Prince Albert, Saskatchewan. What I am not happy to report is that he has now become an official member of the online dating community on a site called Canadian Inmate Connect, an online dating site for inmates. In his profile, he directly lays out that he was tentative about joining the site because he didn't think that anyone on there would look past what he had did to, quote, the human being, unquote. This guy couldn't even mention a person by name. He just calls him a human being. He then goes on to say that his crime does not define him. Wow, I would definitely say that it does. Sounds like a little bit of denial to me. Yeah, a lot of denial. He goes on to say that, just so you know, he enjoys tennis chess, and clever storytelling, and that he's looking for an interesting, open-minded, delightfully imperfect woman to relate to and share amusing observations with. Can I say again what a complete and utter asshole this man is? 
I would venture to say that it cannot be said enough. Well, I guess that's probably enough about Mark Twitchell. I want to close the episode by taking to my soapbox for a minute, if I may. If you ever find yourself in a situation like the one that Jill was in, please, for the love of God, call the police. Do not be embarrassed or ashamed of admitting that you were the victim of a hoax or an attack or anything. People get taken advantage of so much in this world around us, and if we weren't too ashamed to admit it when it happened, we might be able to help and save some people from falling victim. It's true. In this case specifically, it looks like Twitchell may have been found between the attack on Jill and the murder of Johnny. He used the same garage, and you would hope that if there was a report, the police would have gone to the garage to check it out. At which point, there would have been ways to find out who Mark Twitchell was. Who is to say what would have happened? But there is a higher chance that Johnny would be alive today if the police were made aware of the first assault. We all have to do our part, exactly. Sometimes I think that we forget that at the end of the day, we are all in this together. I guess I'm telling you to be a snitch, but I'm okay with that. There's a lesson for this week, I guess. Snitches get Lance's respect? Yeah, something like that. I just want to mention as an aside, um, before we end the episode, I want to bring up that as we really start to ramp things up here at GBNF, we're going to be adding a few more ads for other podcasts on the Darkcast Network and other ads just in general. If you're like me and you don't love sitting through the ads on your podcasts, I do want to remind you that you can sign up on our Patreon at patreon.com forward slash GBNF podcast. And any of the tiers that are $3 or more per month include the ability to have access to our podcasts ad free. So please, if you like what you hear and don't want the ads to break up your listening experience, Check us out on Patreon and help us out for a teeny tiny price and save yourself from all of the ad content. Well, I think that's all for this week then. Oh, no, you don't. What? You're not ending this episode without telling all of the good people about your TikTok that you started for the show. Well, yes, I was going to end the show without telling people. Why? Because I'm still learning. Well, hell, we're still learning how to podcast and people listen to us. So I think they should also be watching you learn how to be young again. Uh, oops. What now? Don't hurt me or I'll snitch. Check out Julie on TikTok at GBNF Pod. Give her a follow and a like. Oh, brother. Will Lance survive until our next episode? Tune in next time on Gone But Never Forgotten.